सवितुर्वरेण्यम अर्गो देवस्यधीमहि प्रचोदयात् ओम स्वः तत्सवितुर्वरेण्यम अर्गो देवस्यधीमहि प्रचोदयासो मद्गमय तमसो मोतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मात गमय ओ शांति Thank you, Suman. Krishna Pani ji, over to you. Yeah. Yes, please. I will share the screen. Yeah. Are you able to see the screen? Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, others can mute themselves okay right now we are going to take up the verses 18 onwards see the <clears throat> coming back to what we have been discussing earlier please remember the title of our program <clears throat> it is atma bodha and intuitive appreciation the reason i am recalling uh, this uh, the the title mentioning the title again is that there is a need for an intuitive appreciation of the awareness of atma atma bodha means becoming aware of the presence of the atman the what we can call it as the presence of the ultimate reality in a microcosm within each one of us which is our essential nature without which the whole of manifestation would be meaningless without the presence of this divinity pervading the whole of manifestation there wouldn't be any purpose for manifestation at all number 1 number 2 unlike other living creatures on this planet the human being has that unique ability of being self aware aware of his own self as an entity in the background we may not every time say that i am there i am there i am there but the essential sense of uh, the presence of something which we identify ourselves as the self is there now this something which we are talking about unfortunately we are using the word something in english but it's not a thing as such but a non material presence which manifests at different levels in different forms this is also an important element to remember that 
the atman as given out in the scriptures is not necessarily something which we realize in ourselves in its fullness but starting from the body from our emotions our thoughts our feelings our actions the various senses which perform their uh, designated uh, activities and all that also indicates the presence of again something i would not like to use that but but let us still use it and say that presence uh, presence of some element which is very intimate and elu elusive at the same time this is what has we have to remember the eye is very intimate to us we know it is there we identify ourselves with it very closely very intimately but at the same time you can't really come to terms with it you can't uh, you know really have a grip on it because it is very subtle very dynamic and constantly in uh, movement of some form or the other so starting from the body onwards right up to the ultimate reality which is enunciated in the scriptures the term atman is used for everything but being becoming acutely aware of its presence is what our whole endeavor is the whole endeavor is to become acutely aware of the presence of what we call as the atman and the main problem appears to be the aberrations and disturbances and the conflict and the uh, you know uh, layers and layers of coverings and the distractions in our uh, life is what is causing the uh, or causing the uh, uh, creating the, the hurdles for realizing the presence of this acutely this is a factor which we have to remember very carefully that is what is atma bodha is about atma bodha means to be awakened to be aware to be alert of what of the atman that is atma bodha now these verses repeatedly through several examples and illustrations and uh, you know similes and uh, explanations and all that try to bring us uh, bring to us the fact of the presence of this uh, what i would call as uh, uh, let us say what is some what is uh, divine what is sacred what constitutes the essence of one's own being that is the whole purpose of this so all the explanations that are given are to be understood in that manner progressively we need to become acutely aware of two things one is that the distractions caused by the whole setup including the body and the thoughts and emotions and uh, the senses and uh, 
uh, mind and uh, the so called intellect and all that are causing a kind of uh, disturbance and seem to be covering the reality behind it or the presence of uh, something which is uh, beyond all these things is what is uh, the, the, uh, the whole our attention is being drawn to that so even before trying to understand what this atman is or what this uh, presence in its uh, fullest form uh, it, truly what it is and all that more important and maybe in some ways easier for us is to see what it is not the whole exercise if you if you see right from the beginning from the from that chapter onwards you find that this is the issue the issue is what it is not and that idea is being continued we have seen several examples given earlier the same thread is continued here in the 18th shloka which we are going to take up now dehendriya mano buddhi prakritibhya vilakshanam tatvritti sakshinam vidyat atmanam rajavat sada one should understand that the atman is always like the king the example given being given is the that of the king okay distinct from what from the body the senses the mind the intellect and matter as a whole okay deha indriya manas buddhi and prakriti the, this is something distinct vilakshanam it is something totally different and distinct from these things from the set of bodies from the Uh, some gentleman mr m venugopal is there in the thing uh, some annotation i think some disturbance is coming um, i don't uh, i'm not able to see all the participants right now because i'm sharing the screen anyway the point i'm trying to make is that including the prakriti including the primordial manifestation of material which constitutes all these things it is something totally different from it distinct from it is the point the being made what what is it it is the atma tad vritti sakshinam is another point witness of the functions of the body the senses the mind the buddhi and the and, and all the material aspects of manifestation this atman is to be known as only a witness to the whole thing that is happening a witness to the whole thing so you see we there are two issues now <clears throat> the atman is something distinct and different from all these things but at the same time it is a witness to the functioning of all these aspects of deha indriya mano manas buddhi prakriti etc as i mentioned in the beginning we need to have an intuitive appreciation of intuitive appreciation of the presence of 
something which is distinct from all these things. In the Viveka Chudamani, Adi Shankara makes a very important statement. We should appreciate the beauty of such statements when he says, Asti Kaschit. There is something. Let us not discuss about what it is. Because what it is, is something which is very, very subtle and elusive and uh, not amenable to the mind, which is the only instrument available to us. But the mind is able to grasp to the extent that there is something, asti kaschit. There is something. The beauty of this approach is, and why we are calling it as intuitive is, the meaning of intuition is understanding something directly and immediately without going through the process of conscious reasoning. That is what is intuition. Intuition is defined as that. So, we may not be consciously reasoning it out and coming to an understanding, but our understanding is direct and immediate, which is what is called as Pratyaksha. The word Pratyaksha means direct and immediate perception. That is what is important for us. Otherwise, if we try to get into discussion and debate and argument and reasoning within a very limited sphere of experience, then there will be a dissipation of energy and we will not understand the reality or the essence of it. The reason why Atma Bodha, as compared to Tattva Bodha, which is very well structured and functioning of all the aspects of Vedanta are given in it. But when it comes to Atma Bodha, it is a question of direct and immediate perception through a process of negation in some respects. To a great extent, we need to negate things in order to come to it. That's what the Upanishads uh, have uh, uh, given out very clearly, which is called as the neti, 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 not this, not this, not this, not this, not this. What is it? You will come to it when you have negated everything. You need not ask or point out and find out what it is. The negation of this tells us the presence of that. Because there is a movement in a different dimension altogether. When we are able to negate all that is known, The, the, the sphere of our knowledge is limited within the space. Beyond this, so you are actually in a direction, if you look at it from a mathematical point of view, you are moving in a direction perpendicular to the plane of space and time. In order to allow intuition to function very efficiently and very effectively, one needs to start with the primary, I should say the basic premise on which the whole exercise should start is I do not know. I do not know. 
and it requires tremendous amount of courage on one side and also a tremendous amount of humility to say that I do not know, which the mind doesn't accept so easily. The mind thinks that I know so many things. I have acquired so much of experience, so much of knowledge, so much of wisdom. So I have a tremendous amount of memory of what I have read, what I have studied, what people have said, and what appears to be very reasonable or my whole belief system, my faith, and the whole thing is built on that. If I have to say I do not know, the whole structure will uh, fall apart uh, um, on my head. That's why it requires courage. And at the same time, as I said, it requires a great amount of humility also because you are denying everything that you know and also simultaneously saying that it is absolutely of no value to me when I want to come face to face with reality. The, 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 you can see this thread in all the verses of the Atma Bodha. So the fundamental aspect that is brought about in this particular verse as we see, just give one second. I'll... Yeah. See, the example that is given in this particular case is that of a king. The king sits on the throne. He doesn't generally participate in any activity. But he is a witness to all the activities and the presence of the king brings about an order in the whole administrative machinery and the kingdom as a whole. His ministers, his counselors, his advisors and uh, the a footman right from the people on the ground, everybody is acting, everybody is doing some function or the other, like the body, the sense organs, the mind and so on and so forth. Of which the king is a witness, he is nothing more than a witness. So this comparison is made here to say that the Atman is like a witness. And the Atman is something distinct and something totally different from the body, the senses, the mind, the intellect, the nature, manifestation, everything. It is something different from it. And, and a beautiful simile is given that it is like the king. Now, in the absence of the king, there will be chaos in the kingdom. There will be chaos in the whole administrative machinery. Because somebody or the other would like to usurp the throne and place of the king and bring about order. The absence of the king would lead to disintegration of the kingdom. So that idea is also presented here that in the absence of the Atman, none of these things function, will function. In fact, they cannot function at all. What gives life, what pervades as consciousness is this reality or this presence of what is called as Atman, which again is bound by ignorance in some ways and appears to be microcosmic. But it is essentially the whole of the macrocosm and beyond the manifestation also. So Atman and Brahman are always considered to be one and the same. <clears throat> essentially there is no difference. But when it is bound through ignorance, 
it appears as though it is microcosmic in nature. That is the thing. So, this example is given here to tell us that the Atman is only a witness. The nature of this Atman is further An objection will be Question. Mr. ji, we can't hear you. That the art is the cause or the main source. Oh, you can't hear me? You can't hear me? Yes or no? Yes, we can uh, hear you. Yes. Yeah, we are able to hear you. Only thing yes. is, the internet is little, little. There is a problem with the internet. So your internet, there is problem, I think, sir. You can restart to audio better. Video, you can take it out. Uh, but uh, you have slides, no? So problem. It's showing yeah, your yeah. bandwidth is low. Your bandwidth is low. It's showing, sir. Krishapaniji, why don't you just reconnect? Yeah. Because that symbol has come, bandwidth is low. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's showing on him, on his name. If we could go to audio mode, that is best. The rest of us could go to audio mode, the load will be less. No, it's Krishna Paniji's uh, uh, bandwidth, not ours. Krishna Paniji, why, I, may I suggest you just disconnect and reconnect? Hello. Yes, Krishna Paniji. Yes, we can hear. We can hear you. Hello. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Stop uh, the. I have stopped the video share video. Okay. Uh, because of the bandwidth issue. Okay. Yeah, one minute. In America, also bad with the issue. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It it will be there. It will be it will be there because uh, uh, in a house, too many things are also connected sometimes. 
three or four phones and two or three computers and the uh, video, uh, you know, the TV and everything will be connected. So there, there could be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Too much is a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Always, you know. And too many people working from home and the neighborhood also, everything matters. So coming back to, uh, you are able to see the screen? Yes, yes, we are able to see. Okay, okay. So uh, as, as I mentioned, the objection that can be raised is that, uh, how can you say that uh, the uh, Atman is not participating because the absence of the Atman, everything is collapsing. So the Atman should be an active participant of the, in the whole thing. So in order to address that question, in order to address that particular question, a, a, another illustration is given. Another illustration is given where we come to the 19th verse and it says, Vyapruthe Shvindriye Shvatma Vyapari Vavivekinam Drishyate Abhreshu Dhavatsu Dhavanniva Yatha Shashi. The moon appears to be running when the clouds move in the sky. Likewise, to the non discriminating person, the Atman appears to be active when it is observed through the functions of the sense organs. Vyaprute Shvindriyeshu. For whom? For an Aviveki. For one who is, whose viveka is not functioning, who is unable to discriminate. For the, yeah, as there, there are some, uh, you know, there's some disturbance. Could you please mute yourself, uh, Mr. Dayananda? Sir. Could you please mute yourself? Yeah, thank you. Because otherwise, uh, uh, some disturbance is coming. Thank you. So, when we are perceiving things from a, you know, uh, lower angle or from a, a, a direction uh, which is uh, projected from the senses, when we are able to see things only through the functionings of the sense organs, for a non-discriminating person, for an aviveki, it appears as though the Atman is actively engaged in the whole process. And the beautiful example that is given is, when the clouds are moving, it sometimes appears to us as though the moon is moving and the clouds are stationary. Isn't it? This is a very common observation which we can see. In fact, a much more, uh, you know, illusion, uh, you know, illusion that is created is when you see trains. When uh, the train on the other track is moving, suddenly if you look out, it may appear as though this our train is moving and the other one is stationary. So this kind of illusion is possible because of the direction of our perception and the basis of our perception. If the basis of our perception is through the senses, because this presence of Atman is pervading the senses also, it may appear as though that the Atman is what is really active and functioning. Just as we see, that the moon appears to be moving or you know running then actually what is moving what we see actually is that the it is the clouds which are moving it is the clouds which are moving so therefore this objection of uh, the presence of the atman as a as an active ingredient 
is something which is not true. It is only the illusory appearance as though this particular active ingredient in the whole process appears to be that of the Atman. So this is a, again a beautiful illustration with a very traditional and uh, uh, stereotypical example that is given in the Vedanta to tell us that the mind can create a lot of illusions. If you, if you today, if you see many of these things, uh, you know, you have a lot of uh, uh, illusion creating images which we can find in the, if you Google them. Something appear, uh, disappears and suddenly appears again. It is only an illusion. So that also tells us about the limitation of the functioning of the senses. So they, therefore, through this illustration again, we are brought to, to realize and come to an intuitive appreciation of the presence of that principle which we are calling it as Atman. See, don't imagine Atman as something material or as an entity. It is neither material nor an entity at all. It is a dynamic state of consciousness which is totally non-material and which is something beyond all these things, beyond in the sense the Mandukya Upanishad, there is a very important mantra, mantra number seven, which uses the same technique again of denying everything. It is neither internal awareness nor external awareness, nor both. Dantah pragyam, nabahif pragyam, nobhayatah pragyam. It is neither internal awareness nor external awareness nor both. It is something different. And he uses six terms. Adrushtam, inconceivable, something which you cannot see. Avyavaharyam, it is something with which you cannot have any relationship because it does not involve itself in any transactional aspect because there is no cause, no effect, effect to it. Avyavaharyam, Agrahyam, it is something which you cannot grasp, hold on to. Alakshanam, it is absolutely attributeless. No attributes can be given to it and you can never say that it is this or that or that or something else and it has certain attributes. Achintyam, you cannot think about it. You cannot imagine, you cannot contemplate, you cannot reason it out. Neither your mind nor your intellect can understand it. Achintyam. Then it is avyapadeshyam, indescribable. You cannot explain to anybody what it is. Finally, he, he has something else also. He adds some positive uh, fact features also because that's only an explanatory part which he goes on to say that all this is the Atman and it is this which we, one needs to know. One needs to know in the sense one needs to 
experientially realize it or come to it. That's what is Atma. You see the terms that are used? Adrushtam, Avyavaharyam, Agrahyam, Alakshanam, Achintyam, and Avyapadeshyam. So all these terms are negative terms. Nothing positive about it. What is it? It is the Atman and you have to know that. You have to know that in the sense you have to come to it. And in order to come to it, none of these things are going to be of any use to you. Your senses, your uh, bodies, your mind, your intellect. These are not the instruments at all to come to it. It is only the foolish. It is only the people who have no discrimination who assume that it is the me which is functioning through all these things and call it as the Atma based on the activities of the bodies and the senses. That is the reason why we have come to this beautiful illustration of the moon appear, appearing to be running or moving, when in fact what is moving is the cloud or the group of clouds. So this again tells us the same thing that please have an intuitive appreciation or understanding of the essential nature of this Atma. Again, I am forced to use these terms like essential and nature, but they are also not the right words at all. But because we have no other means of communication other than words, this verbalization is required. But this verbalization of something non-verbal is itself a great hurdle. So don't hold on to my words as much as to the sense I wish to convey. The sense which is being I am trying to convey through the words is much more important than the words themselves because the words could be misleading and may appear as though we have understood something. It is not about understanding at all. It is about using a faculty totally different from that which we, we are familiar with and used to and come to that realization or move in a dimension in which the mind is generally accustomed to operate. So we are moving in a totally different di dimension in a different direction from this. The whole exercise is that. Because unless uh, we approach this subject with that seriousness, it may appear to be all bumbo jumbo and something you know that doesn't really make any sense at all. But one thing should make sense to all of us, fundamentally one thing should make, a sen make sense to all of us is that none of these things with which I identify myself is really the whole of the truth. I would not call it as the false. It is false in some ways, but because I cannot say that the body is false because I am living in the body, I am operating through the body, 
I cannot call my mind. I cannot call my emotions or feelings or thoughts or whatever it is as false because they, they appear to be much more real than anything else for me. But at the same time, I have a deep sense and a conviction that this is not the whole truth. This is not the whole truth. There should be something beyond this because what I see, what I use, what I operate through is very limited, very partial, very fragmented, very much subject to change, modifications, decay, and finally death. Isn't it? This is quite evident to us. The body is changing. I am not the thoughts because thoughts are also changing. I have several feelings, but I am not the feelings themselves. Because the feelings are also changing. So, this process of elimination leads us to the understanding that there is something beyond this. That is the intuitive appreciation. So, do not mistake for the activities of the body as the real me or the real sense of some presence in me. Just as you don't come to the conclusion that the moon is running or moving at a pace, just because the clouds are moving. So if you focus a little bit, you will see that the moon is at its own place and it is the clouds which are moving. Once you come to that realization, you will also understand one dimension of this Atma, which appears to be pervading everything and actively engaged in so many things, but truly it is only a witness and it is not participating in any of these activities at all. Then another beautiful simile is brought about, another beautiful example is given to us in the verse number 20. The verse number 20 says, Atma Chaitanya Vashritya Dehendriya Manodhiya Dehendriya Manodhiya Svakriya Artheshu Vartante Surya Lokam Yathajana It is not Surya Lokam here, there is a mistake in this print here. It is Surya Loka. Surya Lokam, there should, it should be Surya Lokam. Depending upon the energy of vitality of consciousness, which is called as Atma Chaitanya, the body, senses, mind and intellect engage themselves in their respective activities, just as men work depending upon the light of the sun. In the sense, night time we take rest when it is dark. Morning, we wake up and engage in all our activities. Why do we do that? Because we have the presence of light, the light of the sun. So the Atma is compared to this presence of the light of the sun. In whose presence? All the other things like the bodies, the senses, the mind and the intellect and so on and so forth are engaged in their, their, their respective activities. So, it is uh, the Atman or the Atma Chaitanya is like that illumination of the sun. The presence of the sun brings about activity in this world, isn't it? All activity, depending on the time zones and all, starts when the sun rises. In spite of the fact that there are so many companies and organizations and people 
and uh, shifts and all where we work 24 by 7 and all that. But still, majority of the activity is still carried out during the day only and only after sunrise and majority of the activity comes, you know, down substantially when the sun sets. Now, does it mean that the sun is participating in all these activities? Absolutely not. The sun is uh, not participating in any of these activities in any manner whatsoever. And another aspect which we need to understand is, does it mean that only all, uh, uh, you know, righteous and uh, um, uh, legal and uh, good activities are only taking place uh, when the sun is there? All kinds of activities are taking place. Uh, are taking place. All kinds of activities are carried out. There are good activities, bad activities, and uh, activities which are against nature, against humanity. Uh, so many things are being carried out. Does it mean that the sun is a participant in all those things? It stands to reason that the sun has nothing to do with this. But in the absence of the sun, are these activities carried out? Generally, no. So this again is a beautiful example to tell us the nature of the Atma Chaitanya, the presence of the Atma Chaitanya. Because of which all the activities are carried out. But the Atma Chaitanya has no role to play in any of the activities done by them. There is some disturbance, sir. Some disturbance is there, sir. Mm. Can you kindly mute yourself? I can't see anybody that's unmuted, Krishna Pandji. But why is so much of disturbance coming? Some dis sound is coming. Anyway, fine. Thank you. Uh, well, you are able to hear me clearly, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this, this 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 is also a very apt simile or an example given to illustration given to us to understand the nature of uh, this Atman. It is like the illumination of the sun. Surya Loka. Aloka means illumination or light. Surya Loka means the illumination of the sun. Just as people carry out their activities in the light of the sun, their respective activities, whatever be the nature of their activities, they carry on. Similarly, whatever be the nature of the activities of the body, or activity of the senses, activities of the mind, activities of the so-called intellect and all, everything is carried out in the presence of the Atma Chaitanya. So this, uh, this again is a, 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 repeatedly, if you see the flow of all these verses, through various examples, what is being repeatedly hammered into us is the two most important aspects. One is, as I said, the essential nature of this Atman. The Atman is something totally unique and distinct from all the things which are known to us, number one. More importantly, in the absence of that Atman, nothing would function. These two things should be very, very clear to us. We should be able to have a deep intuitive appreciation of these two factors. Something which may appear to be contradictory if you want to reason it out. Something which appears as though that, uh, how can it be this way? 
the absence creates chaos the presence brings order but the presence of this principle is not directly and actively related to the whole activity the relationship is something mysterious the relationship is something which is beyond our comprehension there is a relationship one cannot deny that there is no relationship but the nature of that relationship is not known or cannot be known from down below here with the available equipment and with the available paraphernalia with the available instruments which we have which includes the mind and the intellect and the senses and all that this cannot grasp it that is the reason why i have quoted the mandukya upanishad mantra this is one mantra which we should repeat in our mind ourselves and allow it to sink in why is it being called as adrushta avyavaharya agrahya alakshana achintya avyapadeshya and how is it that we are asked to realize that because this has engaged the minds of thousands of generations of human beings in search of the ultimate reality if all this were to be something you know created by the mind then all our study is of absolutely no value the presence of this atman which is equated to brahman is a reality which cannot be denied at all because this is what has been reaffirmed through centuries through millennia and there is lot of you know evidence of the presence of this through the lives of the great saints and sages and uh, uh, persons who have uh, actually walked on this earth and who have communicated the beauty of that through their lives that is what is important for us to understand i'll take up some questions i have some time is there janaki ram ji says buddha chose not to talk anything about atman see he, sir because of the confusion it may create he did not want to put it in so many words but he has mentioned very clearly that the first noble truth is dukkha if we examine human life in its totality we find that sorrow is all pervasive and terribly persistent in human life and he went on to say the second noble truth what is the cause for this sorrow and he affirmed that there is a way out of this sorrow and in his own terms he has given a way out also he has mentioned the how to go about with that those are the four noble truths now whether you name it as atman or brahman or not is of no consequence at all 
as i said our whole purpose is to come in contact with that sacredness which will end all sorrow all conflict all pain jiddu krishna murthy also spoke about the same thing when he talked about the about time and timeless and the timeless and he very clearly says that if there were to be nothing like what we call as timeless then this life has no meaning at all what gives meaning to this life is that timeless dimension now that timeless dimension we are using as symbolically we are using the word atman so it the, the, the it is not the semantics or the linguistics or the uh, mere usage of words that matters and that's what i have been insisting i i started today's session by emphasizing on the fact that don't name it they have said it is nameless but un unfortunately we have also seen that unless we have a name and or a form the mind is unable to grasp at all anything the mind cannot grasp anything at all so but the name and form itself is a barrier it's a hurdle we have to go beyond the name because they said it is formless it is nameless now whether you call that formless and nameless thing as atman or brahman a nameless formless atman brahman all these are only terms so it has no relevance the terms are of no relevance at all that is the reason why like the buddha jiddu krishna murthy also said forget about what you cannot know let us forget about the unknown let us start with the known and examine our own lives do you find conflict in your life or not do you find that inadequacy that lacking of something like sorrow pain some amount of pleasure which is also akin to sorrow in a different way do you see this in your own life and is this the only life that is there for me or is there a dimension which is totally different from this or not that is the intuitive appreciation i have been talking right from the beginning i am again emphasizing the fact that unfortunately because it is only verbal communication that is available to us we are using so many terms we are trying to convey something non verbal verbally that also has been identified as a hurdle and that is why another symbol has been created for it in the form of dakshinamurti how does dakshinamurti address his disciples through a silent discourse and what is the transformation in the students or disciples all their doubts are simply they simply vanish they are cleared now such a communication is possible when you have the right person to communicate non verbally and the right disciple to receive it non verbally both are required if you see the dakshinamurti stotra that's what it talks about chitram vatataror mule vruddha shishya guru yuva the disciples are old and the guru is young gurus to maunam vyakhyanam the guru is giving a silent discourse shishya astu chinna samshaya all the samshayas all the doubts and you know uh, lingering questions in their mind everything has been dispelled simply by a silent discourse but unfortunately we are not in that position so we are using these terms to go beyond it 
Use the words to transcend the words. Use the mind to transcend the mind. That is the process available to us. Ramachandranji says, Aviveki, I, I, I'll just uh, stop sharing this uh, thing and then go to the uh, things here, chat. Uh, Aviveki is not aware of Atma and only body and mind. Hence, no way he can say Atma is functioning in him. Yeah, obviously. See, the, 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 uh, when you don't know, what, what you know, you consider that to be the Atman. Whatever you know, that's what I call as the me. At one level, I identify myself with my body. That's the me in me. And the, if I, when I identify myself with my thoughts and ideas and opinions, I call that as the me. But one has to become acutely sensitive to it and come to it in such a way that no, this cannot be the me. This cannot be the whole truth and the complete me. This is only a very partial expression of me. Whether the body or the mind or the thoughts or the feelings or emotions or whatever you are talking about, one needs to understand that this is only a very partial expression of it. How are the life principle and Atman connected or linked? Sir, uh, in a different context, Janaki Ramji, I have uh, discussed about consciousness and life. Consciousness is that, again, I'm using words only. Please try to grasp the sense which I'm trying to convey and not hold on to my words. But I'm trying to use these words very, very carefully. Consciousness is a medium a non-material medium which pervades the whole manifestation and may be compared to what we call as the all-pervasive vital energy. Now, the, when this vital energy enters into something material, embodiment, whether it is a stone or a plant or an animal or a human being or a creature or a bird or an insect or whatever it is, when this vital energy or the medium which pervades the whole of manifestation which is called as the chit. From chit comes chitta. Chit is consciousness. When this enters into a material thing, a material entity, it vivifies that material entity and life becomes manifest through that material entity. So, life principle is a material manifestation of the energy which we call as consciousness. So, therefore, every living creature and according to our ancient Indian, uh, uh, you know, the whole heritage, there is nothing non-living. including a stone. It is living, but in it, the manifestation of that energy is so low, the level of manifestation is, slow, is so gross and low, that it appears almost as though it is not present. As this instrument becomes finer and finer, uh, the material instrument becomes finer and finer, there is a greater and greater manifestation of that energy, which appears in greater and higher forms of life. 
like in a plant, in an animal, and then in a human being, and so on and so forth. So, life principle and this consciousness are connected through the manifestation of an embodied entity. And this embodied entity shows certain features which we call as birth, growth, modification, decay and death. These are shadvikaras. These are called as the six modifications. And interestingly, the first modification they said is asti, presence of something. It is something is there. There is a presence. That's what asti. Unless there is something present, it cannot be born. So asti, jayate, vardhate, viparinamate, kshiyate, nasyati, arvinasyati. So this is, these are called as the shadvikaras or six modifications of something which is present, something which is born, something which grows, something which modifies itself in different forms including reproduction, then it uh, decays and finally it dies. What dies is the material aspect of it. That means there is a withdrawal of that energy from this material principle and therefore we call it as something lifeless now. When the, material, when the, when the energy is withdrawn through its own process, we say something has died or life has left that material entity whether it is a plant or a, an animal or a human being or whatever it is, it, 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 the, the, the uh, exit of that uh, energy appears as though life has gone out of this material entity. So that is the uh, connection between the Atman and the life principle. Ramchandran ji says, Atma is like king and witness only, but king at his will can interfere and bring order. Atma does not do such things, does it? No, there is a problem here. There is a problem here. Sir, please disregard that question. You already yeah, answered yes, it. I have you answered it, no? Yes. Okay, thank you. Stupid question. And no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's a... Okay. Bina ji, Krishna Pandi, can you please post the mantra on the school group with a translation? Oh, you mean to say the Mandukya Upanishad mantra? Mandukya, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can do that. That's not a, a thing. Thank mm. you. Mm. Uh, then uh, uh, Sudha Marathiji, what is the difference between Adrushtam and Al Alokya? What is, the, what is this term, Alokya? I don't understand this term, Alokya. Uh, I, I, I can can uh, the questioner explain to me uh, the source of this term? Is it alokya or alokya? Drushti means sight. Adrushta means that which cannot be seen, that which is not amenable to our sense of sight is what adrushta. Alokya, I have not heard this term. Alokya, I, 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 I don't understand this. Uh, term at all. Uh, I don't know the source of this term also, or it could be something else. In Sanskrit, the term is aloka. Aloka means light. Loka means this world of manifestation. And there are several lokas. There are several lokas after about so seven higher and seven lower, the 14 lokas and all. Uh, they talk about it, but I am not uh, very sure. Can uh, uh, Sudhaji explain to me what is her actual question? Okay, uh, Janaki Ramji has given us some information about uh, Meher Baba voluntary was, voluntarily was silent from the age of 31 till the Samadhi. I am not very sure of this, uh, uh, but I have read somewhere by where he, uh, Meher Baba had given some interviews. Uh, I have read somewhere. I don't know at what age he has done it. 
and I'm not very sure about the uh, whether this is factually correct. If even if it is correct, the fact of the matter is the same thing. Fact of the matter is that he might have thought that uh, there is no point in communicating verbally or orally because it doesn't make any sense. Verbal or oral communication has no uh, meaning because it has a limitation of its own. It it can be misleading uh, in certain respects, or, and it can be clarifying in certain other respects. So, yeah, he might have communicated uh, uh, in a written form, but again, the relevance to our particular discussion is uh, that uh, the lesser the activities of uh, the senses and the mind the greater is the chance or probability of realizing or coming to something which is beyond the mind through that silence in fact uh, as i was mentioning jiddu krishnamurti he would say that uh, can we use the mind like we use a switch of light uh, whenever it is required we switch it on whenever we don't require we switch it off can we do with that our mind because he used to make a distinct differentiation or distinction between a technical mind and a psychological mind You need a technical mind to live in this world. But we have created all the complication through the psychological mind, which always thinks in terms of becoming something. Becoming something. So that becoming is where we are getting stuck with time. We are getting stuck in time. So that is the problem. Okay, so so that uh, psychological mind is the one which creates all the complications, all the conflicts, all the sorrow and the pain is on account of uh, the the conflict between what is and what should be. What is is a fact. What should be is a projection of the mind. So it brings in its wake time, future, aspiration, desire, uh, expectations, and uh, disappointments. So everything is brought about through this process of uh, the psychological mind. So that's what is important for us. So it is the psychological mind which we we need to overcome, or we need to understand the nature of it, and not allow it to function, in order to control our whole uh, life, which is not uh, living at all. According to him, which is not living at all. We are only surviving through these desires, aspirations, and uh, wanting to become something. which is not a fact the fact is the what is what i am at this moment is the fact do i see that am i acutely aware of it or not is the question he would put so that is the fundamental idea here presented uh, any other uh, questions or uh, uh, the clarifications or points for discussion Mm. Uh, I see uh, so many other participants. Most of them are silent. Maybe uh, they have uh, they they are now having a deeper understanding of it, uh, and that's good in uh, so many respects. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. good. Okay. Uh, Amchandra ji has raised uh, this thing. He says the Atma Bodha insights of Sir ji are invaluable. Uh, kindly share all links to assimilate the teachings. Uh, I'm little confused, Ramchandra ji. You want us to? Uh, I've asked 
Krishna Pani ji to share that mantra on the school group. So you will get and, access and to it. Mantra, I think I think he's talking about the uh, video or audio recordings. Ram Chandranji might be talking. Yeah, they, some some I think some recordings are there. Yeah, yeah. Some recordings are there that uh, are being shared by the School of Ancient Wisdom. Yeah. Uh, some earlier recordings uh, could not be done for technical reasons. But anyway, one one thing, Ram Chandranji, don't worry about all these things uh, because they are there in the universal consciousness. You, you, if you connect to it, you can download all these things, <laughs> and, from, and from greater sources. Yeah? You, you can connect to Adi Shankara himself and download it from there. So, <laughs> don't, don't worry. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's an evolutionary process. Let's let us, uh, you know, live in that blissful state in the present, and uh, see the beauty of it. See the beauty of it. That's what, uh, you know, it gives so much of delight. It gives so much of delight because it, the, the presence, the, 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 the now is more important. Sir, uh, Dr. Sana, you would like to say yeah. something? Yeah, yeah. See, uh, you explained about uh, the happenings that uh, happen during daytime, sun, and also a lot of the activities happen in the presence of Atma. They don't ensure only good things. Both good and bad will happen, isn't it? That's what you said. Right, right. Is it something like God has confidence in us and trust in us? Isn't God a free will given to us to exercise, whether to do good or bad in the presence of sunlight or the Atma? Free will. Sir, sir, sir whatever action is done in ignorance, there is no free will there at all. Any action done in ignorance, you cannot call it as free will. It's only foolishness. You see, if I if I am running after a desire, after fulfillment of a desire, and think that it is free will, and I have some free will to do what I like, it is a foolish notion in the sense anything that flows out of ignorance is a limitation. The only thing Free will will operate in the presence of that Atman, in the fullness of its presence. At that time, you have no choice then also. There also, it's not the free will that is operating. Yeah. It is the will of the divine, which is always the right will. Correct. Correct. Which is always right which will act. See, see the see the beauty of it. I was just, uh, I think, uh, a couple of days I was reading some article in which again this uh, beautiful quote of uh, uh, Jesus Christ is given at the time of crucifixion, where uh, I don't know the exact words. Uh, it says, "If it may be possible, let this cup pass by me." But not my will, thine will be done. See, at a, at a lower level, at a at a at a lower level, I it may appear as though that I am undergoing tremendous suffering and uh, and given an opportunity, everybody would like to avoid it. And it happened to Jesus Christ also. Intensity of that crucifixion and that suffering was such that he said, "This, if, if there is any possibility of this cup passing by me, let it happen. But again, he realized the truth of the matter and said, not my will, thy will be done. So what happens is, when the when when the divinity operates, there is no choice there. It is the the divine will. Only dharma will operate. Only truth will operate. So that is what the, the, so in in either case there is nothing like free will, sir. It's a it's a wrong question. 
see this 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 debate between fate and free will and all this is is, is a is a medieval uh, western uh, uh, dominance of a, of certain thought processes that are being imposed on us so there, there, there have been lot of debates about fate and free will destiny and free will and all these things because these are not the, the, uh, i think uh, uh, even uh, uh, there is a beautiful talk by dr alan wallace if you can uh, see it on the his website he says it's a wrong question how can how can free will operate in ignorance through ignorance your state of mind is different in different conditions when you are angry you are in a different state of mind can there be free will when you are jealous when you are greedy when you are full of lust so it is the state of mind that is determining your action and you are not in a state which is beyond these uh, uh, you know modifications of the mind we call them as the arishad vardha or the six enemies kama krodha lobha moha madha and matsarya even in the buddhist uh, canons you find this so the mind is stuck in these things so it can never know what free will is at all if at all you want to think in terms of uh, so called free will it is uh, the illusion of a choice which you have is an illusion of the choice which you have so therefore that is the problem okay so uh, uh, the, we can have a discussion on this also and the free will aspect of it because that's a subject by itself okay sir okay okay wonderful thank you okay thank you sir uh, uh we will uh, uh close the meeting now i think if there is no further discussion it's yeah, already yeah. Yeah. it's already yeah it's already 11:30 yeah. for you we have crossed one and a half hours yeah and uh, uh next sunday there won't be any meeting uh because uh, i'll be i'm traveling on that day i'll be returning to india so 15th we will not be having a meeting right. we will take it up subsequently on the next sunday or any convenient day in between which will be communicated uh, by the school of ancient wisdom no we'll okay. continue with sunday only krishna pani ji but we'll avoid the next sunday because uh, diwali is also there so yeah yeah diwali we'll is also there yeah yeah and i'm i'm not available here you are not available i'll, I'll be in the flight yeah so we'll do next sunday and uh, next sunday we'll take 21 onwards yeah verse 21 onwards yes okay, okay. thank, thank you, you so much krishna pani ji as always thank you for your time for your patience for your you know gently putting the thoughts into our head <laughs> you know and consistently trying to push the thoughts into our head which is great thank you so much um and can i request uh, gulu to say the loka samasta today i will do that yes yeah, please. okay thank you so much thank you all for participating we'll see you now uh, next will be 15th so then we are looking at the 22nd yes right yes we'll see you on the 22nd thank you gulu can you go ahead yeah, yeah. i'll do it. yeah oh लोकासमस्ता सुखी नो भवंतु लोकासमस्ता सुखी नो भवंतु लोकासमस्ता सुखी नो भवंतु ओम शांति 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 
हरि गुरुभ्यो नम हरि Thank you so much, Guru. Thank you, Krishna Pani Ji. Thank you once again, and wish you a very pleasant journey back. Safe, stay safe, please. Yes, thank we, you. We will be in the we will be in the same time zone next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. Love to have you back. Thank you.